Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Tabor. I'm the state coordinator for Connecticut History Day, and this is the third in our series of educator workshops. Today's uh, workshop really is focused on helping students as they are getting to the point of finishing up research, and I should say research is never finished, but as they're starting to think about project creation. Um, we know from surveys from last year that a lot of teachers and students found that transition a little bit hard. So we wanted to do this uh, workshop to help folks think about and help teachers think about how do you help students start pulling together the threads of their research and really start analyzing it and transforming it into a project that they can share with others. And I'm super excited to have a colleague, Jean Malloy, uh, join us from Farmington. Jean uh, did history Day for nine or ten years. She was also part of the team, uh, the National History Day team that worked on this wonderful resource um, with the Library of Congress, uh, a student and teacher guide. And so we're really delighted to have her with us today um, to share some of the tips and uh, knowledge of her experience with History Day and that of her colleagues in Farmington. So we hope that you'll ask questions through the chat and we'll have a chance at the end of this session to answer any questions that come in. So without further ado, Jean. Okay, hi everybody. Um, Rebecca, if you had the slides, you can put up the first slide. Okay. Um, I just, first of all, I just wanna congratulate you for bringing Connecticut History Day to your students. Um, of all the experiences that um, I had as a social studies teacher, I think that um, participating in History Day is by far um, the most valuable experience that you can bring to your students. Um, you know, not only you know, from the students' perspective, you know, they're developing some research and inquiry skills, skills, but you're also giving them an opportunity to, to stretch their skills in deeper into topics and to think critically um, when they're developing their arguments and educating others with, you know, hopefully some original research. Um, when you go to the um, to the competition, seeing their sense of pride and accomplishment in, um, you know, finishing their projects. Um, if they happen to uh, interview an expert, I think that is such a valuable experience. Really, not everybody has to do that, but just talking to an adult outside of the school setting, I think, is great. Um, and that um, that happens during the interview process, which I hope those live interviews are coming back this year because I think that is really valuable for kids to be talking to the judges about the work that they've done. Um, anyway, there are two resources, resources that Rebecca already mentioned, and I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel, but I do want to offer some tips for transforming research into a project. Um, of those two resources that she mentioned, the one that I think is, is the best for students is that one, um, the Finding and Analyzing and Constructing History, a Research Guide for Students. And in particular, I think it was chapter 16, which has some really good organizers and some good pointers for like the point where you are kind of taking your research and moving um, to that, um, putting a project together. Um, so just moving to the next slide. Um, first of all, I wanna credit my colleagues at Irving Robin Middle School because many of these tips and ideas um, come directly from our, um, our eighth grade social studies uh, teachers. Um, they have a local project, a local history project in um, eighth grade that they have been constantly revising and improving and tweaking over the years. And I was lucky to be part of that um, for many years. Sorry about that. Um, and so I certainly can't take credit for all of these um, tips that I'm giving today. Um, and it, you know, I haven't been over there in a year or so, but uh, working with them, but my guess is they have even more and improved ideas. Um, but anyway, before we start talking about moving to the project, I'd like to talk about what students are using to build their project. And it kind of goes back to that note taking and like what do their notes look like and how are they using their notes and how can they use their notes to really show some original thinking and start developing some arguments along the way. So these are just two sample note sheets that, that we have used in the past. Um, there's certainly not one way to, to take notes. I mean, it, students have to do what's best for them, but if you offer them some organizational choices, I know some like to do them online with Noodle tools. Some like to have paper notes. Some like to have these, uh, we use these both digitally and yeah, activities on paper. Activities are free to go, close the activities, you are free to go. Um, most kids usually like to organize it by source and then put the big ideas along the side. 
Um, but as their research gets deeper and deeper, they might switch over to organizing by question and then put the sources on the side. Um, this is just one organizational um, uh, thing that you could use, but I do think you want to set up a system that's going to promote some annotating and reflecting along the way. So if you go to the next slide, Rebecca, I have on the next slide a sample note sheet. And if we had been in person, I probably would have had you like look at this and we could do different things with it. But in any event, this is a, um, a note sheet from a student who did a project and I think believe the theme was triumph and tragedy. It was about David Bushnell who invented the turtle. And these are just some notes that were taken from a very short, I think this came from Britannica, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, if you look at those notes, um, you know, they're well organized. Um, they're organized by uh, source. They have the big ideas on the left there and the student is keeping track of where that information is. Um, but, there's probably room for some individual or original thinking. So what we might do is once students start researching, give them a, like some time to start making their notes. And then you could maybe do a criteria lesson where you look at different types of notes and ask like what the difference is. So if I go to the next slide, Rebecca, you can sort of see, this is where we kind of said, we stopped, we said, let's look at your notes and let's think about those notes. So this was a digital copy, but you could do this if you were highlighting or you could do it if in a different color pen, where now the student is taking those same notes and they're annotating them to kind of connect to the theme. And all of the, uh, the notes in red are sort of the student's thought process about what he found out in this just really short, bibli uh, short piece on an um, online dictionary. And um, you can see sort of on the side, he's sort of like kind of starting to sort out like the design was a triumph, but even though, but there was a failure because it didn't work, but then there's even some more conversation. And another thing that students can do when they're annotating their notes is they can make plans for their next steps with research. So like down on the bottom, he has some questions about, did he continue to try to improve the model because Washington gave him a commission in the engineers. So I don't know what that means. And maybe he's starting to think that there's more opportunity to dig a little deeper about what that means to have a commission in the engineers. Um, so that's just like you're sort of building the uh, time and structure for students to be thinking about their notes because sometimes if you don't stop and think about those notes, you'll find that kids are taking the same notes over and over without any direction. So if we go on to the next slide, does anybody have any questions about those notes before I go on? I'm going so fast. I tend to talk fast sometimes. No? Okay. All right. So, you know, after the students have had a chance to do some research, you know, I don't know, for a couple of days, depending on how many periods you have or how many minutes you have in your period, I think it's also good for them to stop and sort of take stock of um, of what their what their notes what, what they have so far, um, and there's two things that you can do when you kind of stop and take stock of it. Um, it sort of could be a wake up call for some students, but it also could help students kind of hone in and focus where they're going. Um, you could do a discuss. I call it a discuss and a quick write. And this is hard to, to organize in a classroom because with History Day, you have many different topics. So not everybody is discussing the same, the same topics, but you do have the same theme. So these questions are all sort of connected to the, um, the they're, they're connected to that compass sheet, which was helping people kind of pick, uh, figure out what is a frontier. And um, what I've done is I've taken these um, questions and I put them like in a little cup or a little basket. And you could group kids by time periods in history, or I mean that that's, or you could just do random grouping. But um, what you would do is you would give them some time to first kind of look at their notes, maybe go through the notes, maybe do some annotating, maybe highlighting, maybe do some labeling of the notes, you know, as they start to think about where they might be going with this project. And then put them in groups of like, you know, three or four or four students and have them one at a time take a question out of the cup and speak to that question with regards to their topics. 
And I think that gives kids a chance to start talking. And if they've got people doing frontiers, like maybe you could have types of frontiers would be how you could group your students. I don't know. But get them talking about their topic. Because when you have to talk about something, you start to see it clearer. And then after they've had a chance to discuss some of those questions, I call it a quick write. And I literally like set the timer for five minutes or seven minutes and say, OK, I want you to just write for five minutes about your topic. Pick one of those questions, then pick a second question. And if you, you have time, pick another question. And just give them that process of starting to write. Um, because I think that's really eye-opening because the kids might start to look at their notes and think I have all the same thing in my notes or where am I going with this project? I need to have more questions. Or I need to expand the scope of my research. Um, so I like a quick write. Um, at the end of the quick write, um, I think that at that point, um, you could have students again share what they wrote. Um, and just to keep the conversation going and keep generating some ideas about, about the theme, I think that will help kids when they go back to do more research. Um, any questions about the discussion or the quick write? Yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm sorry, I jumped on a little bit late. I was jumping out of one meeting into another meeting, so I apologize for that. Um, and my name is Karima Robinson. I you know, hope to volunteer to be part of this uh, History Day. I'm wondering though, how much time we, we will have with the students? Are we meeting them over the course of a couple of weeks or months, or this is all happening in one day? Um, well, I think that the research process happens over the course of many weeks, okay? And I think, I think the best, my best advice is to not just do research, stop, and do writing. Like, I think you need to kind of like start the research and then give kids time to discuss and write maybe do a little bit more research, then, then stop and work on your thesis. Once you start developing a thesis, maybe you need to stop again, go back to do more research. I mean, I think that it, it happens over multiple weeks. Um, and it, you know, I think it also depends if this is part of your class that you're doing instruction in a history class, or if this is an enrichment program after school or a special program. Um, okay. And are you interested in judging Karima? Yeah, that's what I thought this was. Is that not what this is? No, this is actually um, for educators who are working with History Day students. We do have judges training, and you're welcome uh, to join us. But in terms of judging at the contest, uh, judges usually spend, it depends on the category, but they meet with students once, although they do get some of the materials before the contest. But this is for you know those folks who are in the classroom instructing students to prepare their okay. projects. Got you, got you. Okay, I don't know if I should leave. I don't, <laughs> I don't have students in that in that way. But I was hoping to to volunteer and, and be helpful if I can. Oh well, we would love to have you volunteer. You're welcome to stay and learn more about the program, um, or sign up for one of our judges trainings. That um, if you've already signed up to judge, you should have gotten an email about that. I can hang on until about four. Great. And yeah, and I'll look for the email about the judging part. I, I, must, I must have misunderstood, but I'll okay. look for that email. Okay. As long as you've signed up through the ZFair system, you should have gotten something. So we'll, we'll check that out for you. Okay. All right, great. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. So, um, so that, that was actually a good segue into this, though, like, you know, at, in terms of developing the thesis, which is sort of the next, I believe that's my next slide. Um, and I, I like to call this a working thesis because I think, um, you know, we don't want kids to start with a thesis before they do some research and find out about their project, about their topic first. So, and I also feel that um, most, the most successful students are those students that have um, revised their thesis statement multiple times. And I think as a teacher, it's a good idea to give them some sort of a worksheet uh, where they can, you know, draft a thesis, but then like draft a second thesis and then continue to like and keep their work. So it's like a working thesis. So they don't want to erase something that they've done and then try to go back, but kind of keep all the different iterations so that they can um, go back and look at them and keep multiple working statements. Um, when they do a thesis, this, this chapter that I talked about already, I think it's on page 218. 
I think is really, really helpful talking about the difference between creating an argument or just writing a report and looking at the difference between an argument and a statement of facts, okay? Because we don't want students just writing a report about a topic. We want them framing a historical argument that they are using evidence to support and present in their, in their project. Um, so in that working thesis, um, in that um, book, there's some really good organizers and everything. Um, it talks about the historical lens that should be used when you're developing an argument, both perspective, agency, and hindsight. And I think all of those, um, those that's really, really good advice. Um, when I talk about the elevator pitch, um, I, I feel like once a student has a working thesis or a thesis started, they should have an opportunity to pitch it to somebody else, either another teacher or another student and get some feedback and have some conversations. Because I think that discussing your thesis statement really helps you kind of realize what you want to, what you're trying to prove in your project or what your original research is going to prove. Um, so to, into the next statement, uh, the next slide, sorry. Um, what I did is, this is an activity you could do with your students, is as they're, um, maybe give them a shot at drafting a thesis and then just kind of put it aside and, and then do this criteria lesson where you give them three thesis statements. And if I were to do this, I would put them in groups of maybe three or four students and I'd give each group three colored pieces of paper, strips of paper with these three um, thesis statements on them. And I would ask them to arrange them from the weakest to the strongest um, and, and explain why and like listen to their conversations. As a teacher, you can quickly scan the room and see who's got them in the right order because you can see the different color papers. Um, and I think that that is a good, um, uh, activity. And so then what you would do after if they, they determined, um, I think that the yellow one is the right one here. If they determined that the yellow one was the strongest one, then you would say to them, well, what makes that stronger? And what's wrong with the blue one? Or what's wrong with the green one? And why? So they're starting to pull apart the different parts of a thesis statement. The other thing you could do is you could have them like highlight the different parts. Well, here's the topic. Highlight that in one color. And I think the book does that too. Um, underline where you're making an argument. Underline where you give the historical context or the parameters. Uh, and, and maybe highlight in a different color where, where the theme, where the theme shows up. So if you were to look at these three thesis statements, and I, I did my best to make the green one um, look like it was just as long as the yellow one, because sometimes they go for the longer one, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a stronger thesis statement. But if you look at the green one, um, you know, there's no argument there. It's a lot of facts about Harriet Beecher Stowe. And I don't think there's any mention of, um, let's see, the green one, there's no mention of the theme. It's just a bunch of facts about Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, if you look at the blue one, although it's very short, it does have, um, it has, um, let's see, blue one, no parameters. It doesn't really tell you the context, okay? I suppose the mention of slavery would let you understand it's before the Civil War, but there's no, there's no, um, con and, it, and it does connect to the theme loosely, um, but it does present a little bit of an argument there. So that one I would say would be the middle one, whereas the yellow one kind of has all of the components that you would look for in terms of when we're talking about, you've got your topic, it's Uncle Tom's Cabin, you've got the context with a specific date and also reference to the Civil War. And there's sort of this argument, this kind of two-edged sword, like her book, you know, broke barriers, but those same barriers that it was intended to break in the aftermath started to maintain those barriers. So I think that, that, that puts itself as an argument. So I would recommend that you have kids kind of pull apart some samples. They're really good at telling you what's wrong with poor ones. And then, then looking at the one that's good and saying, well, why is it good? And then let's look at the one I wrote and you could easily see, like they could easily see how they could improve that one statement that they wrote. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Right. And I just want to mention and throw out there, Jean, that we do offer um, a number of new um, 
classroom workshops. And so we do come out and do a historical argumentation and theme thesis workshop with students if, if you're interested in having us come to the classroom or work with students virtually. Yeah, I think that's a great. I mean, I know when I was um, at Irving Robbins, I took advantage of every time we would have somebody come out for a workshop and we would do different things. But um, I think that elevates the importance of this work because, you know, when you're the teacher and you're telling your students, you need to do this, you need to do that, um, that's fine. But when someone else comes in who's perceived sort of as an expert or from Connecticut History Day, it, the kids become a little bit more, um, you know, they listen a little more and they're like, oh, I, now I get it, now I get it. And I think it does add, um, I, I think it, it wakes, wakes some kids up and I think it, it pushes them a little more. So, um, and if you, if, you know, when you go to, when you bring them to the regional contest um, and then they, if they, if they're, if they advance to the state, you, that is such a wake up call because they get to see all that other work and they're like, oh, now I know what I have to do. Thank God I made it to states because now I have an opportunity to improve because they get to see some really good work. So it's great. Um, okay, so this next thing is, um, Another activity that you could do where you um, you talk about like, so the hardest part I think of, of for students to take their, all these wonderful research notes and turn them into a project is they have to come to the realization that some of the notes they took, they're not gonna be able to use. Like it's just not gonna support their argument. And they wanna tell you every detail that they have. And then of course they're up against word counts too. So they have to be able to decide what is the most important information to support my argument. And um, you know, so, so this, you could do a little activity to get that across where you say, well, here's the thesis statement and here's three, um, three uh, options, which one does not belong and let them have a conversation. Um, in this particular one, if we were to keep with that um, same thesis statement, I think it's A, that, that doesn't fit, because it's really just saying, you know, she, that she, uh, her early life shaped her perspectives, but it really doesn't talk about the breaking, um, the, the, evil, the, the, the two sides of the argument that you're trying to prove in terms of barriers. So I think that's a good activity for students, because students really they sometimes they include information that they don't need in their notes and that's a really hard thing not to use all their notes and so many projects i've seen in the past to be honest gene even ones that make nationals where uh, i think the cool thing about history day is that it is an art historical argument it's not a regurgitation report so sometimes you'll have students say when where someone was born or where they went to school and if it's not germane to the argument, it's got to be left out. It's not meant to be a biography. Right. And I think in this, um, this I just thought of something that you could probably do in this. On um, page 219 in that student guide, they have statement of facts and arguable claims. And, you know, you could actually uh, cut those up and, and, and have kids sort them. And that would be a great activity and have them discuss like, well, why, you know, is this a statement or is this an arguable claim? And then have them discuss why that would be a good, like hands-on thing that they could argue um, just to give them some examples. And there's some great examples right in that book that you could use. So, okay. Um, I think the next one is talking about project planning. Um, so for, for project planning, like, you know, the, the funny thing about history is the first thing they want to do is they want to talk about, I'm making an exhibit, I'm doing this, I'm doing that before they even do their research. But I do think that um, at some point, kids will know exactly what they want to do. But you should also make sure that they have time to explore the samples um, of the different types of projects. And um, there, that is the link that's right in National History Day. And I, I think building time in your in your instructional period or during your club time, whatever, for kids to explore some samples. Like they might know that they want to do a website. So have them look at different websites. Um, maybe they can't decide between a performance and a documentary. Have them look at both of those. 
Um, you could have them like consider the pros and cons of each type. I mean, you know, if you have um, video and, and uh, available, you know, maybe you want to do a website or a documentary because you know you have that available. Um, there are some topics where there isn't video available, or maybe you know you have an expert that you're going to interview and record, so you want to have that uh, digital ability. Um, but I definitely think students looking at projects is, is the best thing for, for creating, for picking the best thing. I mean, it, it's kind of hard because you want students to go with their strength, but you also want them to stretch themselves and learn some new things. So um, that's a hard one, but make sure they have time to think about what they're doing before they get into it. Sometimes people think exhibits are the easiest and they just say, I'm gonna do an exhibit, but let me tell you that cutting and gluing and pacing and planning, that is a lot of work. But if you're like really artistically inclined and you have a vision that you could really build a great exhibit with your artistic ability, then that would be the way to go for you. Um, and then some kids are afraid of technology, but I don't think that's the case anymore. I, I, Rebecca, my guess is that more and more people are doing documentaries than they have in the past. Yeah, they have. And um, really right now, the smallest category I would say is performance, because I think that is the most intimidating, um, but it's such a powerful medium. And we do also on our uh, Connecticut History Day page have some Connecticut examples too. If you go into the student page, um, you can check those out. And we have some category uh, videos that we've had alumni share their thoughts on the category in which they participated that students can look at as well. Yeah. I noticed that like if I follow some students like up through the high school that, you know, started it in middle school and they're still doing it. The ones who stick with the same format are the ones that are very successful because they start to learn how to improve and improve as they go along. Um, and then you have some kids who switch and then they learn different skills. So that's fine too. So it, it really is an individual decision, but um, encouraging students to do performances would be great because I think that's, that's amazing. But, um, so another thing that you can do to help with the, get turning the, the research into a, a project is to um, require students to make a proposal, you know, create an organizer that where they have their thesis, they kind of have like, not necessarily outline the whole thing, but like kind of know their big arguments and then have some sort of a vision or description of what this is going to be like and how they're going to engage their audience. I think that's really important too. Like whether it's with, you know, it, with whatever type of project you're doing, what is going to be that eye catching that's going to pull someone in to want to know about uh, uh, what your thesis is. Um, you can do that with a, um, an organizer. And um, I think forcing the kids to kind of like think about those that the big picture um, will help them as well. Um, and sometimes when they get to that point with the project proposal, they might realize, oops, I don't have enough research. So maybe I need to go back and do some more research, or maybe I'm missing a perspective or the opposing viewpoint. Um, and then the most common thing I, I find is, is students don't have enough primary sources. And then now that they, they I think that's, really important, especially when they get into um, trouble with word count, like using primary sources is such a great way to tell your, to, to prove your story because you're not using word count if you can use quotes and what other people are saying. Um, so those are some things that might happen once the um, project proposal and, you know, you cannot approve it, say, no, you got to go back and I need to see more before you can have this project approved. Um, any questions about that? No. Okay, and I think I might have, do I have one more slide? Yeah. I'm sorry, guys, I'm going to run. Um, but thank you so much for this presentation. If you're I don't know if you share a slide, but I'd be happy to receive the slides if you do that. Um, but I'm new to History Day, so this is really helpful kind of uh, background information for me. So thank you so much. Thanks. So the next step, um, I call it prototypes and feedback. Um, I think uh, having students, even before we talk about the prototypes, do have a to-do list, like a moving to-do list where they add things because um, everything always takes longer than you think. And sometimes I think they don't realize how many little details there are at the end 
Um, I call I, I have two things I call an image catcher and a quote catcher, and those could be in one document. Um, it could be a digital document where if as you're doing your research, you might come across some digital um, images that were like, oh, this might be good for my project. So put it in this quote, this image catcher so that you don't have to go back and where did I find that? And include the source there because you do have to source all of your images. So instead of having to go back and find the source later, just put it right in this little image uh, catcher. Um, or you could just have a link to the image that you might want to include later. And I would do the same thing with the quotes too. If you find a really strong quote that you think you might be able to use to support your argument, um, you know, you could highlight it in your notes um, and just, you know, if it's in your notes, it should be connected to the source somewhere on your notes. So, um, but just so you can go back and get it. Um, because those are the things that, those are the things that kids end up doing late at night, like before everything is due, is like the um, work cited and finding those images and all of that. Um, so that might be just a little tip to do as you're, as you're working, as you're um, creating your project and as you're researching. And then um, we've had students create a prototype and the prototype has different things that students would do um, depending on the type of product it is. Uh, for instance, if you were building a website, you would want, and this is sort of like a formative check. It's like, you know, you, you, you just wanna make sure kids are on track and you wanna just like keep the momentum going by having these little deadlines in place. So like for a website, like, so like if you were doing a prototype for a website, by a certain date, you would wanna have the homepage done and maybe one other page and like the kind of the big picture design for all the pages or at least that title for all the other pages so that you would know where the student is going and what direction, and then you'd be able to kind of give them feedback. Um, a paper, you know, obviously an outline would be the most, that would be the prototype that you would look at. And maybe an outline with maybe like the introduction paragraph, the first paragraph, um, that might not be a bad idea as well. For a performance, the first thing students need to do is write a script. So you would want to make sure the script was, was in progress substantially with maybe a description of the costumes, the props, or the setting that they plan to use. And um, similar to a documentary, you would all students would usually write a script first. And then I've seen um, students do like a T chart, a digital T chart, where they have the script that they want to say on one side. And then they sort of reference what images or video are going to go on the other side. It's just a nice way of planning. And that's like probably the hardest part of a documentary. And then once that's done, you're just, it's just kind of the recording and putting it together. Um, an exhibit is a little harder to do a prototype. Um, this, ex this prototype here that I have, um, this was a student who did a digital one. This was done in Google Drawing. And if I, I tried to find a picture of her project to show you, her project was so much more elaborate than this, but this was like her prototype. Um, but it, it developed so much more beyond that. But she really had some planning. Like she kind of knew the images that she was going to do. Um, she uh, sort of organized it. And I think that you could do that. I know I've done it where we've taken the um, the trifold board and kids put all the arguments and all their ideas on stickies and they just move the stickies around the board before they actually uh, started gluing because once you start gluing it's so hard to unglue. Um, and I'm making exhibits sound horrible, but some of the exhibits are beautiful. It's just a lot of work for me uh, to think about. Um, so those I think so if you have a student do a prototype. And then they share the prototype, you know, in a, in a small group where they sit down and they say, this is what I've done so far. Let's share the links so kids can look at the websites or the documentary, whatever, and get feedback. And then the other thing I think is really good to do is not just get feedback in the classroom, ask them to get feedback from another adult. And I love it when they ask adults at home, but not everybody has an adult at home who can sit down and give that. So usually I can muster up a few teachers to be willing, like even in dis different disciplines, to be able to be the adult to give the feedback to, um, to a student who, does, who, can, who hasn't been able to get someone to do it at home. Because I think getting feedback 
um, even they, if they start asking questions, they can start to see the holes in what they're presenting. And I think that's a, a, it's helpful. And it's also, you know, peer, peer feedback is excellent, but I also think getting feedback from someone outside the classroom is, is good too. So that's all I have. If anybody has any questions. Jean, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, you know, I, I love some of what you shared with us in terms of the prototyping and writing a script. And um, for those of us who are educators, the big secret we don't want to tell students is that truly every project, even the ones that seem like they don't involve writing, they are a five paragraph essay. And, um, and of course, as we know, one of the requirements of History Day is that students need to do a title page a process paper and an annotated bibliography. But even with, you know, um, with something like a performance, they have to write a script, a documentary. And I loved the suggestion you made for documentaries of just making sure, uh, you know, the script has the appropriate uh, images because I have seen those documentaries where you keep seeing the same image over and over again. And you're like, I think I just saw that, you know? And so it's, you know, it's, it's also, I think a good, exercise to do because a student might enter this season saying, oh, I, I want to do a documentary, but they're, let's say they're doing, you know, medieval Europe, that might not be their best choice. And once they get down to that point where it's, um, you know, they're putting it together, you know, you see it in, in person. You know, I think the other thing I would say just in terms of advice to folks or, you know, in, in, in advising your students. Websites, we know Web Central takes a lot of time. It's a pretty intensive thing. So we suggest people start early with their websites. Don't wait till like the week before and try to quit, put it together because it's not going to work. And then we see all these requests to be exhibits come in. Um, and that's, you know, at a certain point, we can't keep changing things. So, um you know that's uh, that's also a, a good thing to start early and 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 you know it's funny because we talk about project creation and it's really kind of an intersecting period, isn't it? Because I I've talked to students who have gone to nationals and the week before they're still doing research and like ah oh, I got this interview or I had to, I, you know where sometimes you're trying to reach someone and you don't you know you know make states but you get it right before states, but you couldn't get them for regional. So it's really interesting seeing the project development and how different a project might be at the first stage as to how it ends. But um, did, I just wanted to open it up. Stacy, did you have any questions? Could you just tell me um, one more time the name of that book that you were referencing, Jean? Oh, it's, um, and it actually it's, it's online at um, National History Day, correct, um, Rebecca? Yes. It's called Finding, Analyzing, and Constructing History, a Research Guide for Students. Thank and you. It's the Library of Congress. And it's written by um, History Day teachers, correct, um, Rebecca? Yes. Like the other one that I was involved in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's all, it's all teacher and, and the uh, director of programs at National History Day. Lynn O'Hara was a classroom teacher. Um, actually, she started off as a History Day participant and then was a coach. So she's she's run the gamut. Um, but it is a really great uh, resource uh, to have. And, um, you know, I think the other thing at this stage of the game, we're now in early January. It's hard to believe. Um, it's registration time. Our first deadlines are showing up on January the 20th and 27th. Um, and so as you're registering your students, you know, they might not have the exact title completed um, for their project, but it's okay to put something in as a draft and then go back and change it. Um, but this is kind of the time where students should be thinking of, you know, the beginnings of, of project planning. And, um, you know, I love the idea of the whole draft thesis because we do sometimes have students who are like, oh, I want to write my thesis. And it's like, you can't do that until you do the research. Um, and also the importance of student voice, you know, looking at the different resources and really seeing what they feel is, is important. Right. Yeah. And yeah. just, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying that the, the timing is always a challenge. And uh, the more time that you give your students in class to do it, I think the better. Um, so they have time to 
to take feedback and revise, um, which is really the beauty of History Day is that ability to, you know, change, improve as you go along. And just to close with Jean, do you have a favorite History Day student or a History Day story uh, over the years of students who did just some exceptional research or had a really neat experience? Oh gosh, you're putting me on the spot. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I should have given you warning. Well, you know, my first year that I did History Day, um, it, I think I told you this before, Rebecca, it was, I had gone to see a family member a nephew do history day. I'm like, how come we're not doing history day? So I brought it back to school and we're like, and so we started it. And um, that first class that I had, it was a small group. We, uh, it was an enrichment program. It was a small group of students, but um, that those boys, there was one group, they continued to do it through high school. And I still see them, family members once in a while in town or whatever, and they always talk about it. And they actually ended up going to nationals when they were in high school. And um, I think they might, they, they said it was the best thing they ever did, the best thing they ever, ever did. So um, it was fun to follow them, that first group, yeah. Well, I don't think you can top that. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise. And uh, we look forward to seeing all the wonderful projects coming in. Good luck to everyone. And uh, always be in contact with the state office at info at historydayct.org if you need assistance. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.